Hey guys, how y'all doing tonight? Doing good? Hey, I know we're just praying and all, but I just really want to open up uh, by starting off praying. So if y'all would, uh, just pray with me real quick. Dear God, uh, thank you so much for this time that uh, I get to share with these students, Lord. Uh, please just use me and uh, just speak through me, Lord. Uh, don't let it be my words to them, but your words. Uh, I pray that each one of their hearts just be open tonight to, to receive your message, Lord. Uh, Thank you so much that we have this awesome church that we get to come and just learn more about you and your prayer. Amen. All right, for, so, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zane Nelson. Uh, I've been blessed with the awesome opportunity of getting to serve as an intern here with Siggy this summer. I mean, I just want to say it's been so awesome to get to meet and know so many of y'all. And uh, I'm just so excited that I get to be up here sharing with you tonight. Essentially what we're going to be talking about tonight is actually a pretty simple question, and it's why do you do what you do? And I know it may sound pretty easy, like, well, everyone knows why they do what they do, but it's such an important question. Everyone has something they do, right? For me, it's being a math major and a tennis player at Dallas Baptist University. Those two things alone uh, keep me pretty busy. Uh, tennis is basically like a full-time job in college, and then being a math major is as tough as it sounds. So I'm just always staying busy, right? And however, a huge issue of always being busy is that I just never really got to slow down. I'm just going to do one thing, to doing the next, to doing the next, to doing the next. And I started noticing in my life, even back when in high school when I attended Midland Christian, uh, I'd go to school all day, play tennis in the evening, go to bed, repeat. Senior year of high school, I went to a tennis academy and was playing seven hours of tennis a day. So I was doing that. And even this summer of working as an intern, I just always doing stuff. And I realized that I never really stopped and asked myself, why do I do what I do? And I don't know what it is that you do here tonight. Maybe you play a sport like me. Uh, maybe you play basketball. Maybe you play football. Maybe you play soccer. Maybe you play golf. Maybe you're just like a full-time student and this summer's just been just an awesome break for you. And uh, during the school year, you're just going to school all day, studying all night. Maybe you work, maybe uh, even during the school year, you work, so you go to school, you go to work, and then in the summer you've been just working to pay off a car, get ready for college, whatever it is. Maybe you're a college student like me, uh, going to college, playing a sport. I, I don't know what it is that you do, but I do know each of you has something you do. But have you ever stopped and asked yourself, why do I do what I do? What drives me to do what I do? So when I was kind of going through this question in my own life, God took me to a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. So if you want to open up your Bibles there, we're going to just dig into the word and just see what God has for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians, if you don't know, it's uh, in the New Testament, so it's on the right side of your Bible. Uh, most of y'all probably have those phones and just scrolling. So it'll be kind of towards the bottom of that. Y'all ready? Good? All right. So I'm just going to start reading. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And straight off the back, when I read this verse, God showed me a couple things in my own life that I had wrong. When I first read this verse, God showed me that I was just way too focused on the do's. When I first read this verse, the only part that really stood out to me was where it says that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. So I just saw that dude, and I was like, all right, I'm going to do that. Didn't really have a why behind it. And that's what the entire verse talks about, though, is the why. But I just completely missed it, and I was just so focused on what to do. And then as I kind of started working and trying to discover what my why was, God showed me an, through another truth in this is that I went, sorry, <laughs> uh, for so long, I would tell everybody, I do what I do because I love God. And God showed me through this verse that I just had that order all wrong. As it says in uh, verse 14, where it says, for the love of Christ controls us. In a lot of versions, it says compels. So that for the love of Christ compels us. So that's why we should be doing what we do, because he loves us. So when I would say, I do what I do because I love God, I was missing the point. First John 4, 19 tells us, we love because he first loved us. So I'd always be like, I'm doing this because I love God, but I, I really was missing the why behind I love God in the first place. I was missing, I only love God because of how much he loves me. So what this verse is just telling us is that we have to let God's love for us drive us. 
we have to, have to, have to let God's love for us drive us. And I'm not saying that your love for God shouldn't drive you to do what you do, but you just always have to remember why you love God in the first place. And you may be sitting here tonight just thinking like, why is this college student talking to me and saying that God's love should drive me to do what I do? Like, I'm pretty good how I am. Like, why should I no longer live for myself, but for this God? So let's keep digging in in uh, verse 14 and 15 of uh, 2 Corinthians 5. And Paul, uh, the author of this book, really kind of shows us why we should be wanting to live for God. So I'm going to restart. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. So here it is. That one has died for all, which is Jesus. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And that's exactly what we've been talking about uh, this last three weeks with this Jesus is series, right? Jesus, who is both God and man, came down and he lived the perfect sinless life. And he came and he died and he was our perfect sacrifice. All the wrath that we deserve from our sin, he came and he took on the cross. And that's how much he loves us. Y'all may have heard this verse before, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And there's two cool little truths in that, is that God loves us enough that even despite our sin, that he sent Christ to come and die for us. And then on the second side of that is that Christ also loves us enough that he was willing to come and he was willing to take our punishment that we deserve. Another awesome verse that just describes just how, just how much God loves us is in Romans 5, 6 through 8. It says this, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we're still sinners. Christ died for us while we're still sinners. For me personally, there's only just maybe a handful of people like I would honestly be willing to die for. And that just kind of includes my brother, my parents, and just a few of my best friends and some of the kids I've just really grown close to with this summer. But that's a kind of conditional love because I love them so much because they also love me, right? However, God loves us to a point that just honestly by human standards, it doesn't make sense. I really just thought about how much God loves us and it might sound a little weird, but this is how I describe God's love. It's kind of stupid. Just the fact that God loves us so much that even while we just live a life of disobedience, a life that just dishonors him, a life that just, we run away from him and we purposely just really don't care about him a lot and that God still loves us enough to go die for us, that love is just incredible. That love is what makes Christians want to become a Christian and want to surrender their life. That love changes you. For me, that, that radically, just knowing that one thought just radically changes how I live and why I live. To know that the creator of the universe loves me enough to die for me, it's just insane. To know that even when I mess up, God, even though that God knows when I mess up and know when I sin and know when I'm living for myself, that Christ still came. He's like, yeah, I, I know that you did this and that even in the privacy of your home, you've done this and you just, you've thought this and you've ran away from me for this many years. But you know what? I still love you. I still am going to come and I died for you. That radically should change your life. Just knowing that one fact God is perfect and therefore his love is perfect or our love is actually so imperfect. Like I said, our, our love is very conditional, but God's is unconditional. You cannot run from his love. You cannot do enough bad things to get away from his love. It's just, you, his love is perfect and unconditional. Romans 8, 37 to 39 says this about God's love. Knowing all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why we're talking about what we're talking about tonight, that the why do you do what you do? When you know this, just how much God loves you, that should drive you to do what you do. As uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says this, that the love of Christ compels us, the love of Christ controls us. When you know just how much he loves you, you want nothing else but to live all for him and not for yourself. And it's just knowing that one fact just radically has shaped my own life. That's why I'm up here today. Honestly, my biggest fear in life is talking in front of people. Absolute biggest fear. However, just how much God loves me and just how much he loves each one of you, that's why I'm willing to get up here. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I am at this church this summer. That's why I'm pursuing to be a youth pastor in the future. It's just because God loves me. And that radically changed my life. My path is going one way, and the guy's like, nah, I love you so much, and I know what's best for you. John 10.10 10 says that he gives us a life that's abundant. And he's like, this is the path for you. This is a better path. This is the path that is filled with joy, that is filled with a peace that transcends all understanding. Like, I honestly don't know how I'm talking in front of you right now. In the adult meeting beforehand, I was like shaking. I, like, God is just so good, guys. And I want each one of y'all to know that. That's why I'm up here. I want each one of y'all to be love-driven. I want each one of you to just know just how much God loves you, that even despite all the sins that you've committed and despite the fact that we live a life of disobedience, despite the fact that sometimes we even hate him, despite the times that we just run from him, despite the times that we even question, is he for real? Despite the times that we just live only for ourselves and not for him, he still loves us and he paid the price for our sins so he can call you his. You are his, I am his. He bought us with his, with his blood on the cross. That is a love that just doesn't make sense. It's a love that changes people. It's the love that causes your small group leaders to come up here every single Wednesday and to come and pour into your lives. They could easily be doing something a lot more productive with their lives uh, than come up on a Wednesday night and come spend time with a bunch of teenagers, but man, they, they have seen God's love for them and they, they want each one of you to share it. That's why they're here. That's why Dustin preaches on Sundays and, sometime, and also in here, because he wants for you to have the same life that he has, a life that's just driven by the love of Christ. I, that's what I want for each one of you tonight, that you can say exactly what Paul says, is that I want each one of you to be able to say, for the love of Christ controls me. Because that's why I do what I do. I do what I do because he loves me. And that's just, it changes how you live and why you live. Because I, I really just hope each one of you can conclude that Jesus has died for you. Because that, knowing that one thing just changes your life. So I, I have four little applications that I, I want to leave you with and uh, for you to just kind of talk about in you know, small groups and to be thinking about the rest of the week. Because like Dustin always says that I hope what we share with you today changes how you live tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So the first one is just ask yourself, why do I do what I do? What drives me to do what I do? Why do I play basketball? Why do I play tennis? Why, why am I uh, just going to school every day? Why am I working? Be, and be honest with yourself. Please, please be honest with yourself. For probably seven, eight years, I lied to myself. I would go and before a tennis match, I'd be like, oh, glory to God. I'm playing for tennis for God's glory. But in reality, I was living for myself. I, I would say, uh, even on Twitter, I'd be like, oh, glory for God, right? And then after I lost, I would blame it on him. If I won, it was all about me. And I don't want that for y'all. Because when I changed and just let God's love drive me, it's a life abundantly that he promises. There's a joy that's unexplainable and a peace that transcends all understanding. Next, next three things are pretty, gonna be pretty easy to remember. They're all start, they all start with an R. So the first one is relate. Relate with God, develop a relationship with him. 
That's why he died on the cross for you. When he died, the veil was torn from top to bottom. That's, and the veil was where a high priest would go through and be able to talk to God. And he wants for us to have that relationship with him. That, so we relate with him, talk to him, pray to him, listen to what he has to say. Next thing, renew. Renew your mind daily. Remember just how much God loves you. Remember what he's done for you. Remember how that should change how you live your life. And then also read. How is he going to renew your mind if you don't read just how much he loves you and what he's done for you. So get in this Bible. Make it the first thing you do every day. Pray and then read the Bible. Get to know God. Just he, as it says in 1 John 4, it says that God is love. Get to know who he is. And lastly, resolve. Resolve to every single thing that you do, that you do it because you're love driven by God. Resolve whenever you're doing something to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is my purpose behind doing what I'm doing? Ask yourself. Resolve to renew your mind. Resolve to read the Bible. Because if you don't resolve to do it, it's just going to be another thing that you have to do. And it's another thing you have to check off. But I, I really, really pray and just hope each one of you allows God's love to drive you as you leave here and as we go into small groups. I want for each one of you to say that for the love of Christ controls me. Because it changes lives. It changes lives. Pray with me. Dear God, uh, thank you so much for this day. God, you're so awesome. Uh, thank you so much that I get to share with all these students that you love so dearly. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the, that it just changes you and that it just brings a joy and a peace that transcends all understanding. I pray that each one of these students here today live for you and not for themselves because that's a life that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you give a life abundantly. Lord, I, I hope as we uh, go into small groups that there's just incredible discussions as we try to wrestle with the question of why do I do what I do. I love you so much, Lord, and I love each one of these students. In your prayer, amen.